desired, and uh, I think that this is this would be fairly simple. So I hope that's uh, a good time to do that. It's about machine learning and uh, and DFT. And of course, you hear a lot about uh, machine learning these days in many different contexts. In particular, with Google and the enormous amount of data that they have stored in different uh, contexts and. Uh, Machine learning is also beginning to make its way into combinations of uh, machine learning and electronic software technology. But uh, there are different ways of using machine learning. And actually, I will only look at a, at a small corner of that. That's the corner where machine learning is used to, to develop new exchange correlation functions. There are other uses where you might generate data with your calculations and want to analyze these and understand them. And you might even try to make predictive models based on this using machine learning. And you might hear something more about this tomorrow when Stefan Kozuolo and Thomas Pico are giving their talks about materials informatics. But today I just focus on machine learning in connection with development of exchange correlation functions. So here's an, an, an outline. I'll start with some, some basic questions about the DFT and the way DFT works. And then I'll give you an introduction to model construction and selection within sort of the Bayesian way of doing this. So that's something that maybe you are familiar with this, maybe not. I think it's not still not sort of standard, the part of standard curriculum, but it's it's fairly simple and I hope you will enjoy that. And then I'll tell about some of the new functionals that we have been, been developing, in particular with the error estimation and error analysis included in these functions. And at the end, I'll show an example uh, where most of the work was done at, uh, at uh, Stanford, Thomas Peeple School, by uh, AJ sitting up there. And uh, that's sort of the, the outline. So, uh, as you know, that's the function of theory. We've seen many examples of, uh, of the use. It's used in many different uh, scientific areas. We talk about predictive power, and it does have some predictive power, but we also know that there are many different uh, limitations, and depending on which kind of exchange correlation function you, you use, it can actually be the quality of the calculation may, may vary a lot. Uh, and how do you then evaluate how good your function is? Well, usually you may try it on a couple of systems and compare to experiment, or you might ask somebody more experienced than you, well, does it work for this? What do you think? And uh, we could ask, if that's really the best way to, uh, to, to go around that. At least there's no systematic theory for this. And uh, also, as you also know, the environment depends on the particular kind of systems. For example, you know, if you're going to look at chemisorption and bonding on surfaces, you should certainly not use PBE or prefer maybe RPE instead of that. So that's the situation as, as it is. You can see an example here. This is what people have been done. This is molecular bond images not actually uh, decay or more ago. But the way you compare with LDA, you have errors of 1.4 AB. If you use PBD, it's 0.3. And if you use RPD, it's 0.2 AB. So that gives you some indication that if you want molecular bond images within the GGA, you should at least go with the RPD. Even more so if you look at bonding and surfaces, you have errors which are almost 2 AB. Uh, with LDA, half an AB with PBE and 0.3 with RPE. So that's kind of say, information that you can try to collect, but of course there's no real sort of theory or understanding behind this. Um, one point that I'd like to, to make is that if we look at this previous slide here, we have errors of the order say 0.3 EV or 0.2 EV. If we look at, at the cohesive energies of solids, the error might be again some tenth of an E, V, 0.3, 0.4 E. But at the same time, if you want to look at uh, energy differences between different structures, for example, if you have a top crystal and you have it in an FCC structure and an ECC structure, and you ask what's the energy difference, then you might try to calculate that and you will get a very small number of the order 10 to 100 milli electron volts. But still, it turns out, from experience, that this calculation is actually quite reliable. So even though the bonding of the copper FCC may be wrong by up to half an EV, 
you can cool tiny energy differences between different structures. Here's a calculation done by Hans Krieger where you compare with FCC uh, some other uh, structures, uh, BCC and uh, ATP. FCC is the green line, so ATP is relative to FCC and BCC here, and actually you get the right structure for these uh, position levels. So it means it's a reliable calculation. But the energy differences are tiny compared to errors you have if you look at cohesive energy. So it would actually be nice to somehow be able to know the reliability for the actual calculation that you are doing. So a couple of questions here. We, other speakers here talked about the, 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 uh, the Purdue ladder of, of approximations here where you can do it more and more accurate. But you can ask a couple of questions. What if you sort of go in at a certain level here? What is then the best you can do? Well, what do you mean by best? What do you want to apply it for? That's one thing. But also, best could mean also, as you go up here, you use more and more computational effort. So, of course, you would like to, for a given computational effort, to actually do the best you can. And could you actually replace this uh, experience that people have where, well, you can probably use it here, but not on this system, or maybe with this different functional? Could we have a more systematic way of, of uh, approaching that? Those are some of the questions that I'm trying to, to address. So, now I'm coming to model construction or model uh, selection, or as I've written up here with very small letters, fitting. Because, you know, fitting doesn't sound very nice. Model selection or model construction sounds a lot nicer. But in many situations, it's actually the same thing. And uh, what I try to, uh, to convince you is also that fitting can actually be an interesting thing. And that also, it doesn't mean that you can get whatever you like just because you're fitted. Of course, uh, it, it does have a very sort of bad reputation. You can see a quote here. Uh, I remember my friend John from London used to say, with four parameters, I can fit an elephant, and with five, I can make him whip with his trunk. Okay? So, uh, this is a uh, well established physicist not being very impressed by, by fitting. And you also see some. Weird, uh, weird results in the literature. For example, there's a guy here in 75 that actually seriously made an investigation where he concluded that if you wanted to fit an elephant, you needed 30 parameters. Okay? But uh, actually, you can find mathematical packages in the internet doing this with 15. Okay? So what's the answer? Of course, this question is ridiculous. I mean, if I invent an elephant function, which has exactly the shape of an elephant, then I don't need any parameters or just one to fit it. Okay, so I mean, this is sort of the, the kind of questions you have to, to uh, be, be, be careful with. But uh, we'll move on and try to fit the elephant. Okay, here we have an elephant from a Danish book. Uh, although we will not try to fit all of the elephant, but only sort of a small part of it, which happens to be a sine function. And uh, this sine function here is evaluated in 11 points. So let's say now, to try to get into to fitting, that we have these, uh, we really want to fit this function. We have information from 11 data points. And uh, what should we do? Okay, one easy thing to do is to say, okay, we think that the, the function is probably something where we can do a Taylor expansion. So we'll do a polynomial. So we'll introduce some parameters, they are 0, 1, 2, 3, here, and so on. And then we'll do the fitting. Okay, how does it go? Whoops. Okay, before I turn to that, okay. Okay. Before we go to why is this happening here? I'm just uh, sorry, I'm just uh, confused here. Okay, we'll have this intermezzo here. Um, and then I'll turn to the uh, to, to fill in the area in a moment. So the basis for fitting in the theory of model construction and so on is probability theory. And in fact, probability theory is not that uh, complicated. There are only two rules, essentially, that you need to know about probabilities. Maybe one or two more. But if we talk about events, <laughs> x and y, and the probability for, for these events, then there is one product rule saying that the probability of x and y, which in this way or that way, this is actually given by the probability of y taking place 
And then you multiply with the probability that if y has happened, then x will happen. So that's the same. That's the probability of x and y. Or you can switch it around and say that's the probability of x times the probability of y given x. That's pretty, pretty natural. And uh, this only other rule is this of uh, the sum rule. That if you have y to be a set of, of events covering all possibilities and they're disjoint, well then the probability of x can be calculated as the sum of the probability of all possible y's here, then you just sum the bulk x and the probability of x and y. So these are just the rules that we're going to, to apply from probability theory. Then, out of this, it's quite easy to show what's called base theorem. Here. It's just taking this equation up here and dividing by, by this guy here. And then you can see that the probability of x given y can now be related to the probability of y given x. And then some other factors here. So what you're actually doing here in Bayes' theorem is that you're turning around cause and effect. So if x is responsible for the occurrence of y, you just ask the question, if you see y, how do you know, do you know then that x was the cause? That's sort of the way that it's, it switched around. So this was invented by Thomas Bayes, but also it has a long history where other notable people like Laplace and Alan Turing, uh, Turing actually used this kind of approach, the base approach, during the Second World War to decipher the uh, codes. And uh, where this kind of uh, theorem, even though it's very simple, it's actually a, a, a much uh, debated uh, thing that I'll come, come back to. Let's take a simple example here. Let's say we have a disease that we call D and a test for this disease that we call T. Then let's say that out of the, uh, out of the thousand of the population, they actually have this disease. So the probability of the disease is one per mil and not disease is 999 per gram. Okay? Now you have a test, and that test is 99% good. Meaning that if you have a disease, it will be positive in 99% of the cases and negative in only 1%. And the other way around, if you don't have the disease, it will only 1% be positive and pretend that it's shown that you have <coughs> the same thing. Okay, so now a quick question to you. This is the situation. You get a positive test, positive meaning, showing that you have the disease, so it's not good. But what is then the risk that you have the disease? Showing that you have when you, when you get this test. And it's just, before we show the calculation, have a quick, quick walk here. Is this probability around, you have these probabilities, how many would go for 1%? A few, 10%? Yes, yeah, you have some more. Yeah. 99%, a little less, okay? It seems to be 90% that's most popular. Well, the right result is 9%, so about 10%. And uh, why is that so? Well, if you have a thousand people, one is ill. If you make the test, then that works for 99%, but that means you will show that 10 are actually ill. But only wrong was actually ill, so it's about 10% if you get this positive thing. So it's also something which is quite important if you decide to do screening in whole populations, because you can see you can generate, even though 99% for a test is very good, you can easily generate lots of people being worried about having a disease, even though it's, the probability is actually quite low. Uh, the way you can do it with base theory is here. So just take this and say, given the test is positive, what's the probability from the disease? It's related to the, the, the opposite probability here. And you multiply this, and then the denominator is the probability that the test is true. And then you use the sum rule and say that that's the probability of the test times that you have a disease, probability due to process negative here. And then if you calculate it, you get these 9%. Okay, so what this illustrates, first of all, it's, it's very simple to do this, but also, well, you, you better do it right, because it's, it's actually, uh, you can easily fool yourself. 
with these kinds of, of uh, probability. Okay, so base theory is now moved. We're going to use that for model selection. And that's actually where a lot of the of, uh, uh, discussion has happened between statisticians and statisticians over the time. Because uh, what we're going to do now is to say we have some data, a database D. And then we have a model with some parameters theta. And we're going to use Bayes' theorem to say, okay, we have this data. What is then the probability for the model? Or if you like, what is the probability distribution for the model parameters? So now we have some data, and we have some models, and we want to have probability for the models. This is actually, was at least, quite controversial. Because, you know, there are some guys in statistics, the so-called frequentists, that say probability is a frequency. It's something that you do a lot of experiments many times, and then you see which fraction is A and which fraction is B, and then you get the, the probability. But of course, if you have a model, what, what does that mean? What were all the experiments that you were doing? <coughs> because, the, because the model is not something that, that's actually related directly to, to a frequency. But that's where I think over time these so-called patients have actually been more and more accepted and, and the techniques. Uh, I think for most, most people in, in, in physics, I think this seems pretty, pretty natural that you have probability distribution of models. And then what has happened here is that we use space theory so that the probability for a given model, given the data, is now connected to the probability of the data given the model. And then these factors here, where this guy is called the prior probability. That's where you can put in your ideas about, for a start, if you have a, if you have a model, if you believe it or not, if or what do you think? Do you have for some other reasons to say that this model should probably behave this way? Then you put it into this probability here. And that's of course also what some statisticians do not like. It sort of begins to look subjective instead of objective. But the whole idea is that if you have data enough, then this will actually become quite unimportant. So, how does this work? Well, if we just take a, a look at this factor here, this guy we could say, that's now, given the model is true with some parameters, what's in the probability for the data? But if we calculate some data points, then we calculate those with the model, and we get this value here, given the parameters theta. Okay, then we could say, well, we have some noise. So the probability that actually observing this data point, given that this one is true, is a Gaussian with this noise. Okay, so in that case, we now actually can invert this and say, we get an expression for the probability of the model given the data, which is the same. Except we can put in a prior probability if we want. So, what if we take this expression and say, okay, this is probability distribution for the model, but we just want the most probable model, the one with the highest probability. But that means we should take the one where this one is the smallest one. And then you can see this returns to reduces to just as each square's fit. Where you take the sum of the squares, the deviation between the model and your data points, and you sum over the square in such a cost function, and you minimize it. Okay, so now we have a way of going from data to a model and a probability distribution for models. Let's now return to the, to the uh, elephant that we wanted to, uh, to fit here, and the expansion in the polynomials. Now, if we take a first order polynomial, which is a line, that's pretty lousy. Second order is better, seventh order is really great. And we can actually see as a function of the polynomial order, we have the cost function, which is the sum of the square of the deviations here. It's really going down. And we can also look at the real quality of the fit by comparing to the sine function and taking the difference there, squaring and integrating. So that tells the, the real quality. So you can see the cost function, the deviation says we're doing fine, and we're doing fine. This is great. The higher the order, the better the fit. But, if we go to 8th order, then it suddenly goes wrong. If you look at the cost function, 
which is the deviation at the data point, then everything is fine. You get a very, very small error. But the fit of this eight orbital polynomial is just lousy compared to the, to the uh, actual function, the sine function. So, and if you look at the coefficients in this polynomial, suddenly some of the coefficients become 6,000 or 8,000. So it's a really weird fit. So we can see, okay, it's good to include a more and more sophisticated model, a better, better polynomial, but there is a limit. We are overfitting here. And this uh, overfitting becomes even worse if we also had some noise in the data. So if we had an elephant here, but then a bit of noise on the way it, uh, it looks, and again, we crank up the order. Already when you go, go to sixth order, it doesn't look good. And if you look at the as a function of the polynomial order, the cost function is just the deviation at the data point, and that becomes better and better. But the deviation from the sign is really exploding here. Eighth order is really crazy, as you can see. Because you're fitting some of the noise also. So this is something which, of course, uh, has to be done. Let me show you this, as, as I explained. This was sort of the best fit model. But also, we do not only get the best fit, we actually get a whole probability distribution from base theorem. And what do they look like? They look like this. Here you have the examples for first order, second order, sixth order, and so on. And again, it goes completely crazy. The so-called variance of the model, the flexibility in the model, is clearly too large here. And it goes, sorry. So, how can one deal with this problem? of the overfit. Well, that's actually where the prior probabilities come in. You can either call it prior probabilities, it's also called regularization. So that's a way of, of, of controlling this. So we saw again here how, how bad it goes for eighth order. But what we can do now is, for example, we can say, well, we don't believe that in the fit that we're going to make, we will have coefficients with a value of 8,000. I mean, we're fitting a function of order 1 and so on. So let's say that all the coefficients should be of the order 1. Then we can put in a probability saying that the sum of all these coefficients should be controlled by a certain probability here. An exponential, and we have a parameter here we can choose. Determining how large the parameters should be allowed to be. So if you just look at the cost function, then this exponential goes together with, let me see here, goes together with this exponential, which is the cost function. So you just, actually, another way of looking at it is that you add this punishment to the cost function of the sum over the variables, and you have a parameter to control. Now, if you take a reasonable value for that parameter, you can see that the eighth order fit is actually now not as bad. And instead of going completely crazy here, you can actually sort of control the behavior for large amounts of parameters. So, so far, Bayes' theorem provides a probability distribution of models from a set of data. And uh, you have the model complexity is important though. If you have too many parameters, the variance is too big and you overfit. On the other hand, if you have too few parameters, the model is too simple and you cannot fit the points, and that's called bias. So you have to find a trade-off between bias, a too simple model, and variance, a too complicated model. And the prior probabilities is a way to control this old figure. Then there is one complication in the things that we're going to, to, to look at here, which is that it's not just that we have noisy data, but actually the models we're going to use, or in actually the data point that we're going to look at, they, they have fairly small uh, noise in them. But actually the, the models we're going to use, <coughs> to use will be fairly biased or too simple. So that means that the probability distribution that we have in, in, in the ensemble we generate, that's <coughs> Usually in the standard way, that's determined by the noise. But we actually need an ensemble which also takes the badness of the model, the bias into account. And uh, you can see that here. Here we're fitting a sign, 
with 100 data points, and you can see the ensemble here is, uh, this is a single polynomial, the ensemble is this wide, and if you have more data points, 1,000 data points, they are not shown here, but there are many more data points, then the ensemble, the uncertainty in the model, will be much smaller. However, if we take a third order polynomial, which is the dashed line here, you can see it deviates actually from the, from the red line, but around the red line you have a gray ensemble, which is too narrow. So if you want that ensemble to represent also the, the quality of the model, we have to modify things a bit. And that's what I'm doing here. Here we say that to make an ensemble of models, a probability distribution for the models, which again is given by the cost function, but which is just the square of the deviations between the model and the data. But now we have a tunable parameter, which we can call a temperature. It looks like a bottom distribution. And actually, this is the this is the situation here. Let's say that this is the truth. Okay, this is really where we would like to be. This is the correct model, the perfect quantum mechanics. But, in fact, we are bound to be over behind this curve here, because our models are not perfect. We cannot fit the perfect quantum mechanics. And therefore, we make an ensemble of models over this region here, and how far we go in is given by the distance here to the truth. You can see if you have a model here, which you use to make a prediction, and then you have a model just slightly next to that, that will give you a different model. And if these two models give completely different predictions, that probably means you shouldn't trust them. Okay? But if all the models in this regime here tend to give more or less the same result, then it's probably trustworthy. Okay, so that's what this ensemble is used for, and in fact this parameter uh, T, or temperature, can be chosen so that on the average, the estimation of the errors that you can do with these ensembles will actually give the actual error that you have in your data, compared to the best fit and the real data. And if you do that for the, for the, for the example with the third one we looked at before, now you get an ensemble which actually covers uh, all the way over the the, uh, the true sign function. Okay, so that's a uh, modification. Okay, so what we're going to look at are models for exchange and correlation. And so the models that we pick are sort of, uh, we have to say if we do a GTA or MeTGTA or whatever, or we could maybe come up with some completely new ideas. But I mean, that's sort of, we have to pick a model. The databases can be all different kinds of systems, molecules, solids, and so on. But of course, what you pick here might actually influence your result in the end if you try to generate a new function this way. So these are not uh, trivial questions. <coughs> you have to know what's the variety of data, what are the relative weight that you put on different data and so on. Then you have to worry about overfitting by using priors of regularization. And also, if there are actually data points which are not to be believed, there's something called robustness, which you could see on the post that uh, Kip Lungo had here, how you can actually do what's called robust fitting, but I'm not going to, into that. That's a way of avoiding outliers. And then we would like to keep this uh, error estimation in the functional, so that we can get reliability on the predictions. So, the simplest example was done about a decade ago. And that's where we take a GTA and we take the enhancement factor, which looks like this in PBE and in RPE. It's a function of the dimensionless gradient. And what we do is just that we expand this on a number of with a number of parameters. And then we just fit it. And the database that was picked at this time was pretty small, just 20 molecules and 12 solids. And then we just minimize the deviation here. And we have to worry about this old thing, and in fact, a very simple way of, of testing this here is that if you have, say, uh, 30 molecules, you optimize your model on the 29 of those, and you see how well does it do on the last one. And then you average over all these to check how well it's doing. That's called cross-validation, and this particular way is called leaving one out. 
Okay, so that's a way of estimating how well your model is doing. And you can see then that the cost function will always go down as a function of parameters, a lot of complexity. But at some point, the test will begin to go up, showing that, ah, beware. Now you're actually beginning to overfit. So in this simple model, we just have uh, three parameters. And then if you do the fit, you get a new, uh, a new uh, functional. And one funny thing is that the first parameter here is actually the value of the enhancement factor at uh, zero gradient. And it turns out, just from the fit, to be exactly one. Which is, of course, nice. Which, that is the LDA limit. But it actually comes out of, of, of the fit. What you can also see is that uh, if comparing the best fit to PDPE and RPB, it's better. Not a lot, but it's better. But if you go to just the, the molecules, it turns out that RPB is better than the best fit, but PB is worse. But if you go to the solids, then PB is better and RPB is worse. Okay. So, so you can see really you have these compromises when you try to make models that different kinds of systems actually want your model to do different things. And then we can make an ensemble of these uh, enhancement factors. And in this way, we can make uh, error estimates by calculating a quantity, not only for one GTA, but for the whole ensemble, and look at how the calculated value is spread out. So if they are very narrowly determined, we will say this is probably a, a good estimation if it's wide. We'll have to well, don't want to worry about the accuracy. And if you do this, you can actually see the clouds here. These are cohesive energies and atomic volumes for some solids, and the clouds are these ensembles. You can see sodium, it's very easy to get the cohesive energy, but it's actually quite difficult to get the right volume. But if you go to diamond, it's quite easy to get the right volume, but it's not so easy to get the right cohesive energy. And in fact, if you compare with experiments, it sort of does what it, what it should, that about two-thirds of the observables are within the, the one sigma of what you're estimating. OK. And then back to the example that I talked about with if you have cover in FCC and BCC structures. What you see with this ensemble is that the piece of energy has an uncertainty of half a volt. So that's not calculated very well. But if you look at the BCC and FCC energy difference, the error is only 4 millivolts. The error. So you actually automatically in this way, you get uh, an evaluation which can be quite different by several orders of magnitude of energies, depending on the properties that you calculate. So you can see here, it's, it's all put to scale, that the green here is the ensemble. And you can see it spreads out enormously in the increase of energy and it really doesn't spread out in the uh, energy difference between the two structures. Okay. So we have to worry about some, some limitations here, of course. That it depends on the model, it depends on the database, it depends on the weight that you put on different things. We cannot get away from that. Uh, and of course, if you try to calculate something which is not at all represented in the database, you cannot be sure what is happening. It could also be that, for example, the property that you try to describe is simply not in your model. If we have a GTA, we know the Van der Waals interactions, long-range Van der Waals interactions, cannot be described. Okay? That doesn't help us then to do these ensemble tricks. It means if we have two isolated systems, we'll get an interaction energy of zero, and we'll get zero for the fluctuations in the ensemble, because all GTA models will give zero. So, one has to be concerned about things like that. So, what has happened the last uh, couple of years is that we have worked uh, more on different kinds of functionals, these so-called uh, B functionals. There are now uh, two on, uh, two on uh, these uh, half the B van der Waals, which is a GTA, but including non-local correlation from van der Waals. There's a meta B, which is included uh, both the density gradient, but also the kinetic energy density in the exchange here. And uh, last, which is just being uh, produced now, is a combination of the two, where you have a meter GTA with Van der Waals interactions. And this is some work uh, which has been going on both here in uh, 
in uh, Lundbyen and also quite a lot recently at, uh, at Stanford, in Thomas B. Gorsh, who's over there. So there's a reference here on this. And uh, one of the things that we noticed was that when you're doing this regularization, okay, that's for example if you take the enhancement factor. What is the property that you want to punish? What is it that you think should be obeyed by this function? Because if you allow any, everything, it can be a weird function. And it turns out that a good thing to do is what's called ticket of regularization, which is actually taking the, the uh, smoothness of the function. So what we say is that, well, we want the functions in the functional to be fairly smooth. And if they begin to wiggle a lot, we punish that. So that's a prior thing that we put into the models. And it turns out that that improves a lot the transferability of these models to situations outside of the, of the database. Another thing is how we estimate this uh, overfitting or the risk of that. And then we use something called bootstrapping. You're not supposed to, uh, you, this is just so that you have the formulas if you look at the, uh, at the uh, slides uh, later on. What you do with bootstrapping is that it's more advanced and leave one out. You have, say, n systems, and then you pick out of these n systems. But you might pick out the same system several times. That's called a bootstrapping sample. And then you fit to this, and then you try to see how well do you do on the other data points. And in this way, you can get an estimate of uh, whether you are uh, overfitting. This is something called the 0.632 rule from an estimated prediction error. And here you can see an example. Here is a regularization parameter. And if you're calculating this estimated prediction error, you can see that if you have a too low regularization, it means that the model is, is too complicated, too high variance, and that will be punished. And if you go to too simple a model, it's too biased, and that will be punished. So we get an idea about, about where you should be, and that can be transformed into an effective number of parameters that you have in your model. In this case, it's rather 12 or 13 parameters that you have in your model. So the data sets that has been used, they now include quite a variety of, of things. There are molecules and molecular reaction energies, there are solids, cohesive energies and lattice constants, absorption energies, and also some non-covalent uh, interactions. Some of these data have been uh, obtained experimentally, and others have been obtained by, by high-quality uh, uh, quantum calculations. Okay. So, again, we can see now with our more advanced models, we can see that if we just fit to individual databases, Actually, in this case, it's an enhancement factor. You can see that it, it, it can vary quite a lot. And also, if you train on only a one data set and you try to use it on a different data set, it actually might not work very well. This is for the the uh, beef and the large studies. Okay? Of course, what you would like to obtain is really that your model is so general <coughs> that you can describe all different kinds of systems. But that's a question of, of getting a sufficient lead. Uh, say physical, good, physical and good model that you can actually do that. Another issue is that if you have two kinds of, of data sets, here you have molecules, molecular binding energies, and you have non-covalent bonded systems, then you have a choice how much weight you want to put on these two classes of systems. There can be some, some things can be done automatically, but in the end it's actually, uh, there are some choices that you have to do. What you can see here is that if you put a lot of weight on the mo molecules, that's this F factor, we are moving up to high values, what happens is that the cost, the error you get on that data set becomes very small, or cl close to one, which is the one you obtain if you only fit to that. But then the, uh, the error on the other that data set might explode. And the other way around, if you put all the weight on the S22, the error on G2 may be very big. So what you want to do is to somehow balance this choice. And there are different choices you can make. So that you sort of try to do both data sets in a reasonable way. So here's one of these uh, examples, which are just uh, these uh, hashing factors for the beef and the and also here is the amount of correlation 
that's uh, put in, and there you also have a distribution of this. Uh, and this is available in the G-Core, as you know. And it's also been put into quantum espresso. So, let's try to make some, some comparisons. Here we have the B van der Waals and the beta beef. And on, on the data set you see here, overall, the beta beef is doing, doing uh, sort of the best. But, uh, and you can see that, for example, to take some critical things, B van der Waals is actually not doing that well on solid lattice contacts. But that's actually where the meta GTA can do uh, a lot better. You can see some of the other meta GTAs are also doing quite well here. So, again, you can see that, for example, for the B van der Waals, it wasn't possible to get uh, both molecular formation energies, which are good, gas, gas, gas phase reactions, consumption, and so on. They are very good, but then you have to pay some price. And of course, what you need to do is to get a better functional, with better components in there. And uh, let me show a uh, funny thing that with this meta beef, it's actually not fitted to Van der Waals system. But actually, it's doing on the database that we use for Van der Waals systems, it's actually doing uh, fairly well. Which is probably because this data set has really Van der Waals bonded systems, but also has some hydrogen bonded systems. And a good part of the hydrogen bonding can actually be described within this, uh, within this framework. So, what if we go to uh, uh, these kinds of plots that, that uh, Georg Kresser also talked about show that if you have several parameters, several quantities, like here you have surface energies and kinesorption energies, then there's a tendency for functionals of the same class to be on a line. So what we really want to do, do here is to go down to zero, because these are the errors you get. So zero is down here. Okay. But you can see that if you have a GTA or van der Waals functional, they tend to stay up here. And maybe this, you can see B van der Waals is getting a bit of the way at least, uh, but it's not, uh, it's not trivial to break these, uh, these constraints. There is another example where the meta GTAs is doing reaction energies and uh, solid uh, bond moduli uh, quite well, but if you just take the GTA, it tends not to, uh, it, 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 you cannot do both well. But the end result, which is a function of that, that is just being, being finalized now, is a meta GTA functional, including also uh, Van der Waals. And uh, we're actually uh, very happy with that. You can see that on um, consumption energies, it's doing as well as, for example, RPD. On cohesive energies, it's also doing uh, very well. Uh, on lattice constants, it's doing much better than the B Van der Waals which is, of course, a, a crucial thing in, in many, in many contact, uh, contexts. gas phase reactions, it's all in, in the middle of the narrow field here. And the non-covalent bonding is also fine. So we really hope that this will be a robust sort of all-round uh, functional that can be used, for example, for chemisorption, but where at the same time you also get good uh, bond length and length constants. Um, let me say that there are some other, uh, before I go to, to, to an example where this has been used, I just mentioned that there are some other uh, efforts uh, in this direction using machine learning. Here's one by Kieran Burke and his group. Uh, they are not really developing a new functional, but they are trying to use machine learning, in this case, to do the kinetic energy. So to try to do the whole kinetic energy, but without actually solving the Kohn-Chan equation. And the method they are using is called kernel rich regression. I will not go, go uh, through that, it's actually not very, very complicated. But it's kind of, in, in, what's an advantage for this kind of method is that you don't have a particular functional form. Okay? It's more of an overall interpolation. So what you actually need, and what you could also do in principle for exchange correlation functionals, would be to have many different, uh, you should have lots of data, where you have lots of calculations for a certain density. This density gives this exchange correlation energy. This density gives this exchange correlation energy. 
And then what this uh, current rich regression is doing is essentially interpolating. So if you come with a new density, you need a distance measure saying, OK, I'm this far away from that data point, and I'm that far away from that like, data point. Then I know sort of what kind of average I should, I should do it. So it's not a very advanced method. In a way, the problem is that you will need lots of data because you are doing this interpolation all the time. So it's an advantage that you give up the idea of having, say, a GGA or a meter GGA. It might be a much more general thing that you do, but the challenge is to get lots of data. And I think that has not been solved yet how to do that. Um, and furthermore, this is actually only in one, di one dimension, so it cannot be really used for any data. It's, it's a step. It's a step. So the last thing is uh, I want to show the, the, uh, an application that uh, Jens Nosko also mentioned the other day for this uh, B from the last error estimation uh, on ammonia. This is work done uh, in particular by Andrew Redford sitting up there and other guys from, from uh, Jens Nosko and some of people's group in uh, Stanford. And this is ammonia synthesis. And uh, what you do is that you write up all the elementary steps that you have in this, uh, in this uh, ammonia production. And then you use weight theory to calculate the binding energies and the bearings and so on. And that gives you a model for uh, how much ammonia can be produced. Uh, this is just because it's a nice process. <laughs> so, if we go back to these ensembles, here's a, an example of 17 kinesorption energies where you calculate now the ensemble the width of what you would expect. It turns out that the functional is optimized not only to kinesorption energies but to many different things. So it actually tends to overestimate the errors in kinesorption energies slightly. So what was done in this work was this was rescaled a bit so that you actually get the right prediction of the errors in particular on the, on the kinesorption energy. And here you have such an, an example of enhancement uh, factors, which is used to give this, uh, this distribution. Then the turnover frequency is calculated from this micro uh, reaction uh, model. And uh, what you can see here is the uh, calculated uh, uh, turnover frequency uh, as a function of temperature. And uh, now you, what you can do is that you can have the error bars. And the error bars is actually what you have in this red uh, red region here around the, the uh, prediction. And uh, again, just like the example with the cohesive energy and the structural energy, there might be a lot of correlation between the prediction of different quantities. And that's actually shown here that if you had to include these correlations, the error bar is a lot smaller than what you get from the gray area where you haven't included these, uh, these correlations. And also, if you have uh, the experiment here for the transition state uh, energy for the nitrogen dissociation, which is the rate limiting step, uh, and the effective activation energy, you can actually see that you sort of falls within the, the error bar that you predict from the, uh, from the model. So, here are some, as a function of nitrogen binding energies, you show for different systems the calculated uh, turnover frequencies. And again, here you have the absolute values, but here you're doing it relative to iron. So here you're saying, is ruthenium more or less active than iron, and you're doing the difference. And you can see that the error bar here is then reduced quite significantly. And you can actually now estimate these uh, activities relative to, to iron in a, in a better way, if you include these uh, correlations. And as also pointed out by, by uh, Jens the other day, that you could use the scaling relations and get this, uh, this uh, volcano right here as a function of the nitrogen the binding energy. And he also pointed out this uh, very small plot here, but what you see here is the correlation between the nitrogen binding energy and the dissociation energy area for the uh, nitrogen nitrogen form. And uh, uh, what has been known is that this is correlated quite a lot for different uh, metal surfaces, which is why you can use the scaling. But you can also see from these clouds here that these are the, how it correlates within the ensembles. And you can see that they're very, very highly correlated inside the ensemble. 
So actually, it almost collapses on the scaling relation here. And that also means that the, the uncertainty in the prediction, for example, the prediction of the maximum here, that actually turns out to be about minus 0.6 eb. And the error bar on that prediction is only a little bit less than a tenth of an eb. So you could say that this shows that if you want to find a very active catalyst, you should have this nitrogen bonding energy, and you can actually, in, in only within that region here, which you can see is a lot more narrow than the scale here between the different metals, where this is varied by several eb. So you can actually, it's a demonstration that DFT is good enough to make reliable predictions of these kinds of things. Because now we actually know that we have an estimate of the error of where the maximum of the volcano should, should be. Okay, so, uh, well, I hope I have shown you that fitting, even though it has a bad reputation, can actually be fun. And there's also some probabilistic theory behind it that gives you a handle on, on what, you are, what you are doing. But you have to be careful, because there are many pitfalls. So, we can get esti er estimation of error bars and DFT calculations in this way, and we'll make some new uh, functionals that we hope are fairly robust and can be used on many different kinds of, of systems. And of course, you could imagine that you could go to more advanced functionals, uh, hybrids, and so on. It might put uh, more demands again on databases that you can, you can uh, they use for this, but it's a uh, possible uh, way to go. And these functionals are available in, in G4. So, some references and thanks to some of the other people here. Uh, not least uh, lately here from the Stanford group is Velko and Kedoko and Tom Pico and Andrew uh, for the work that they've been uh, doing there and, and for some of the earlier work in John Wolf who was involved in that also and uh, and uh, Christ and Jim said that. So uh, thank you for your attention. Questions from the audience? Yes? Um, so, do the K points convergence or energy cutoff factor in at all into the, into the analysis? Or do you just use the same for all the systems? I mean, what, what, what you need to do is to make sure that it is converged. I mean, that, that's, a, that's, of course, an, an, an issue. Another issue along the same lines are the, the PAW setups, the shoot potentials that we use. And we also have to, uh, we need those to be, to, to be accurate. Um, of course, if there, are, if there are some errors in that respect, that will be involved in the fitting somehow, which might actually, if you look at it from sort of a machine learning point of view, from the, the actual code you have and the way you're doing the calculations, it, it, it might actually be possible to say, even though, say, one of the pseudo-predictions are bad, that might be included in a strange way in the fitting and the optimization you do. But of course, it, it's not very interesting in the way that, that you cannot use it for a different code or different uh, shooting potential. So, of course, you need to, uh, to, uh, to uh, avoid that as, as, as much as possible. So, I mean, that's something where, where you spend quite a lot of effort to, uh, to make sure that the, uh, the calculations are converged. Yes. Um, when you introduced this base uh, theory in the beginning, I understood to say that the hope is that this um, your idea of how good the model is somehow cancels out when you take a bigger base uh, data set. I don't understand how this No, works. I mean, I'm not sure what you mean, but, but the, the point is that if you have a, a, a certain, uh, say, class of models, uh, then the, the larger the data set, the more advanced you can make your model, the more flexibility you can put into your model, because the data will control uh, that this model is not overfit. So these things go together. If you only have a small database, then you need a, a very simple model in order not to overfit. But if you have more and more data, but of course, again, what does more and more data mean? 
I mean, you could say we have some cohesive entities of solids, and we could maybe take twice as many of those. And that would, of course, give more data. But it's not sure that it will give really some new information. But it might be that including a different kinds of, kinds of systems in the database might be better in that respect. So I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's a tricky thing. But basically, it's the, in any case, I mean, the more data, the better. That's what is in the end determining the model. And then you have to avoid the overfitting given the amount of data that you, were, that you have available. One attempt is to do kind of reverse machine learning, where you actually I mean, use machine learning to find the optimum data set uh, to fit of, or use uh, that you have the model for. So you, instead of just have a lot of data for energy, so then you actually take a look at I mean, what atoms are in the system, what, uh, what are the lattice constants, what is the structure, and then see, okay, then you take this new system you're looking at, and then you see how that fits into I mean, analyze that structure and then, then the, some system will determine this is the best model for that kind of system. It's not something that, that I, I, not in this, so this, this way, way like it has been, why has been used, and I don't know how you would, I mean, in general, you could say that if you in some way can generate new good data points, I mean, you don't have to be, you should just include them. I mean, include as much data as you can as long as it's reliable data. And, but I don't know any way of sort of knowing which way to move in data space to, 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 to be optimal in that respect. No. How much does Meta be Hunter's cost in computer time compared to the big Hunter? Well, it's similar to, to, to the, uh, to the uh, Meta GTAs, and then you have the Hunter Bar, so it's uh, dependent on, on, on the system size. And it, so it's, I think it, it, it's basically similar to the, uh, the, the fundamentality of the case of um, uh, Further questions? Yeah. I have one more. Um, in Schuler school, they also, I mean, the fit functions with a lot of uh, parameters and also solution models and so on. General differences in their approach of um, I haven't seen their, 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 the, the way that they are doing uh, say, control of the overfitting and so on in the same way. I, I, I'm not sure, but I cannot do that at the right comparison. I think it looks like there are no further questions. Let's thank Carson again.